we can count or something. Let's talk about the harvest today and turn our Bibles to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 9. <coughs> oh, no mics. Hold on. But don't hold back, sticker had me messed up. Maybe that's what I meant. Don't hold back from turning your mic on or something. <laughs> Luke chapter 9, and let's look together here at verse 57, and we'll go through chapter 10 and verse 3. As they were traveling on the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus told him, foxes have dens and birds of the sky have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Then he said to another, Follow me. Lord, he said, first, let me go bury my father. But he told him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and spread the news of the kingdom of God. Another also said, I will follow you, Lord, but first, let me go and say goodbye to those at my house. But Jesus said to him, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. And after this, the Lord appointed 70 others, and he sent them ahead of him in Paris to every town and place where he himself was about to go. He told them, the harvest is abundant, but the workers are few. Therefore, pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. And Father, as we bow before you today, we make that our prayer to you. That you, Lord, would send out laborers into the fields of harvest and that you, Lord, would make us to be those laborers as well. We pray, Father, that we would receive a true and holy burden for the lost around us and realize that in your divine plan, we are the means that you have ordained of having them to know the good news that is found in you. And I pray, Father, today if there's any of that harvest among this people today, Lord, that, Father, you would grant grace so that repentance and faith would come, that souls would be saved. And I pray, Lord, that you would bless we who know you to leave this place today a changed people, a people ready and willing to truly sacrifice all for your gospel. Lead us now, we pray, Lord, we ask, and we pray these things in Jesus' name for his glory. Amen. I have always had in my heart a soft spot for the American farmer. Even though I wasn't raised on a farm, my family was coal miners. Even I am smart enough to know that farmers feed me. Therefore, I like farmers. And I want farmers to have the, the very best existence they can have. And I want them to have every benefit they can get. And I want them to go forth having a harvest that is plentiful. And one thing about farmers, I grew up in western Kentucky, which isn't anywhere near as hilly as, as the region even we live in here. There's acres and acres and miles and miles and miles of cropland. And every spring, you would see them, they're getting out, they're putting the seed in the ground. And then they're coming out and they're fertilizing it. And they're putting the weed killer on it. And they're doing everything they can to make sure this harvest is right. And then harvest comes. And it doesn't matter what's going on in your life. It doesn't matter if you're sick. It doesn't matter if you're down. It doesn't matter what is happening. When harvest time comes, it is an all-hands-on-deck event. All the family gets out. And if the family isn't enough to get the crop in, they hire others to get out as well. Let me tell you how serious it is. Not everybody here may get this, but some of you will. It was so serious that this last deer season, when I was back home in Kentucky to hunt, it had been so wet that the beans still hadn't got in. And those farmers who had those beans had a chance right in the middle of deer season to get those crops in. And guess what? They did not hunt to get that harvest in. That is huge to a deer hunter, in case you didn't know that. 
I talked to one poor guy. He was the father of a, uh, he was the son of a, a man that has a lot of crops. And, you know, we just asked him, hey, you, you going to get to get out this week and go after him? And he said, no. He said, if dad's in the field, we're all going to be in the field. That's how it goes. All hands on deck for the time of harvest comes. And Jesus calls us today to see that it is the very same way when it comes to the souls of men. He says to his disciples, the harvest is abundant, but the workers are few. Therefore, pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. And this is the message of God that he is bringing us today as we end this year and we begin the next. As we close out 2017 and begin 2018 and the harvest, my brothers and sisters, has not changed. It is still abundant and the workers are still few. And we are still commanded to pray for more harvesters to enter the fields as we labor in those fields of souls ourselves. I give you this word. I give you this challenge. I give you this vision as we look to this new year. Be those laborers. Be the laborers that are going out into these fields of harvest that are abundant. I pray we've all got faith to accept this and embrace it. And I want us to labor. I want us to pray. I want us to seek. I want us to serve, to love and witness our Lord Jesus Christ. Do incredible things as we are in the fields. His fields of harvest. And I want to see 2018 become a year of true harvest to the Lord our God. Listen, folks. Out of everything First Baptist has going for it, and of all the ministries we've got going, and all the offerings, and all of the stuff we're doing, and all of this, this is where we need to centralize ourselves yet again. We need to get back to seeing this church family as a group of harvesters. We meet here once a week to get re-equipped to go back out into the mission field, back out into the fields of harvest. I want us to be disciples that make a difference and truly make disciples that are making a difference in the world of darkness around us. And it all begins right here by understanding, acknowledging, and embracing the reality that God calls us, you, to labor in the fields of souls for a harvest that glorifies his name. We have a faith that's worth having. Therefore, it is a faith that is worth sharing. And may we truly hear him now. May we truly prepare to change our lives for his will and glory as we think first this morning about following the Lord of the heart. A question comes to my mind. When our Lord Jesus says, the harvest is abundant, but the workers are few. The question in my mind is why? Why are the workers few? Now granted, when Jesus spoke these words, there were not that many following him. You got to remember, at the end of Jesus' ministry, the total numbers of disciples amounted to like 120 people. That was it. So there literally wasn't many following him. But even in our day, when there are many that profess Jesus as the Lord and Savior, the workers are still few. Take, for example, our little town of Woodsfield here. There is a church on every corner here. It seems like there is a church for every family here. But even with all of these churches and all of these professing Christians, the workers are still few. And look even to our church family. There's many here that do a lot here. And I want to just say thank you for all of your labor in the Lord. I appreciate it. I benefit from it. And so does everybody else here. Thank you for what you do to the Lord and what you do for the Lord, I should say. 
But even among us, let's just be honest with this. The laborers are few. Very few. And why is that? And please understand, I'm, I'm not looking to, to play a whack-a-mole game or something with you today. I, I'm, not, I'm not hiding a big club up here just ready to beat you with it. I, I'm asking an honest question to you and to me. Why are there so few laborers even here among us that say we love our Lord Jesus Christ? Is it fear? It could be, sure. Is it lack of concern? It could be. Is it too much focus on ourselves? Yes. Always. Is it too much love of this world? Possibly. Is it we don't feel that we know how to do it? Maybe. Could it be all of the above? Absolutely. Why are the workers few? So few that Jesus would tell what few workers he did have that we need to pray Therefore, to the Lord of the harvest, to send out workers into his harvest. The answer comes to us earlier in this scripture, as we see that our priorities must change if we will labor in the harvest. And that's the root of why he calls us to pray for more laborers. Priorities aren't what they should be. The Bible tells us in verse 57 that as they were traveling on the road. Now, I just want to stop here for a brief moment and explain that. As they are traveling on the road, what does that mean? It means they are still traveling on the road to Jerusalem. Jesus is here quite literally walking to his death. And as he is walking to Jerusalem there to die for you and for me, to give his life in our place, to suffer for our sins, that we would be saved by him as he is walking on the road. What he says to these people is so mind-blowing that none of us could believe it and none of us would obey it if it wasn't for the fact that Jesus is walking to his cross. What I want to plant your mind right here is everything Jesus is about to say the price that he calls his followers to pay is a price that he himself is walking to pay. Amen. That's, right. That's what he's doing. So they're walking along. And as they are walking, someone comes up to him and tells him, I will follow you wherever you go. I will follow you wherever you go. That's a good thing to hear, right? I will follow you, Lord, wherever you go. If somebody came up here and said that, we, we couldn't fill this Baptist tree fast enough to get them wet. Hallelujah! They're following Christ. We would be totally excited. Jesus, not so much. Here's why. Jesus says, foxes have dens and birds of the sky have nests, but... The Son of Man has no place to lay his head. That is an odd way of responding to a guy who just said, I'll follow you wherever you go. What Jesus just told this guy was that to follow him meant that he was going to have to abandon all creature comforts. Whatever comfort you find in and from this world to yourself has to be abandoned if you're going to follow Jesus. I guess Jesus just simply did not know that words like that run people off. Jesus definitely needed to learn the four spiritual laws here. Doesn't, doesn't he know that such a hard saying as that might turn someone away? But guess what? He's not done that. It gets worse. After he tells this man that, he looks to another person and he says, follow me. You 
follow me. And this guy responds to Jesus by saying, Lord, let me first go bury my father. Now that seems prudent, doesn't it? You can hold off on following Jesus to take care of family matters, right? Sure. We all think that. In fact, it was a critically important thing to a Jew. It was really important to them for fathers to be buried by their sons, for sons to bury their fathers. It was actually had become a religious duty for them. My old uh, seminary professor, Robert Stein, says that for a Jew, this was a religious duty having precedent over everything else. Everything else. Nothing was more important than this. So surely Jesus will be reasonable and understand that, right? Sure. We've, we've heard of people giving up worship of Jesus for family time, right? Maybe you've even said that, right? I, I would worship Christ, but we're going to have family time tonight. As if that's an equal thing. It's not. But in our minds, that makes sense. Hey, God should be okay with this. I come to church 50 Sundays a year. Jesus can deal with me not being for two, for family time. Surely Jesus will get this, right? Surely Jesus understands this. No, here's what he says. Let the dead bury their dead. You come and follow me. Did you just hear what he said? Could you imagine if you were there that day? Now, I've never lost a parent. I can't imagine how utterly heartbreaking that would be. If my mother died, I don't know what it would take to stop me from getting back to the funeral. It would be a big deal to me. And I know many of you have lost parents, and, and you, you know, you know the emotion that this stirs up. Now, can you imagine standing there and Jesus says, you follow me. And you say, count me in, Lord. Just one thing. I'm going to go bury dad. Then I'll be back with you. And then Jesus responds to you by saying, let me tell you something, son. You go let the dead bury their dead. You come and follow me. Let's be honest. Let's, let's just be straight here with, with what's happening. If that had been you or me, and I, I shudder to think about this, but I'm just being honest with you, I, I really think we would look at it and say, man, who do you think you are? You would pull me away from my family? I don't think so. Of course, this guy really would have flipped out if he heard Jesus say something like, whoever loves me must love me more than father or mother, sister or brother. Son or daughter. Jesus seems totally not unconcerned, but just totally blunt. If you want to follow me, this is what it costs. You have to prioritize me above your family. Let me just throw this one to you. Because I've seen it. And I, I don't apologize for being passionate about this while ago, but I've been racking my mind a lot about people I've seen uh, sort of abandon the faith. And in almost nine out of ten cases, the one commonality they had is that their families gave them the impression that they were more important than Christ. They made church and they made worship and they made God optional to their lives. And I don't want to see anybody else fall away. I don't want to see that happen anymore. And what we do to the church, if we ever gave that impression that that was okay, because Jesus says right here, it's not. To follow him means get rid of every creature comfort on earth. You can take comfort in nothing but me now means I have to be the highest love, 
and priority of your life. Let the dead bury their dead. You come and follow me. And it doesn't stop there. Another person comes up to him and says, I will follow you, Lord. And again, yes, fill the baptistry. Get the membership books out. Get the love cards out. Let's get it. I will follow you, Lord, but first. Have you learned now? The but first don't work with Jesus. But first, let me go and say goodbye to those at my house. Totally reasonable. Totally reasonable, right? Just let me go say bye to mom and dad. Then I'll come and I'll be yours. And Jesus looks at him and says, okay, cool, man, go do that. I'll wait here for you. No. Jesus says, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. <laughs> Jesus is here saying that even family, even the mere thought of just connecting with them that one last time, cannot be a greater priority than him in our lives. He even says in Luke 14, 26, if anyone comes to me, doesn't hate his own father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. He can't. That's what Jesus says. These are his terms. Our love for Jesus must make all other loves in our lives look like hate. Now, folks, all these people that Jesus spoke to had one thing in common. They were seeking to follow Jesus on their terms. It is the great sin of the American church too, that we're going to follow Jesus as we want to follow him, and he best be happy with it. That's what these folks were doing. And that is why he absolutely slaughters their intention by saying, don't think you can follow me and look back at this world. Don't even think you can be fit for my kingdom and still labor in this kingdom of earth. Now I know what I'm about to say might be mind-boggling to we believers living in a day and age where we bow to nearly everything with our faith and worship to the dictates and schedules of this world. But Jesus states plainly that there is only one way to follow him. And that one way is on his terms. And it's an all in endeavor. It's all in. Nothing out. All in. Now, when he calls us to labor in his fields and to pray for others to come to labor in the fields of harvest, that's the type of person that he accepts. And don't miss that. When Jesus is saying, pray to the Lord of the harvest to send forth laborers into the harvest, that's the type of laborers he's talking about. Those who have given up all comfort in the world. Those who have, who have just divorced themselves from all earthly connection to prioritize him above all. That's the laborer he's looking for. His laborers are those that truly put him first. First above their families, first above their work, first above their comforts, first above their sports, first above all. All. He is saying that you can't count yourself a follower of him if you give greater priority to anything in your life than him. That's why the workers are few, my brothers and my sisters. They're few because few are willing to pay that price. Few are willing to give him the uncompromised and unqualified commitment of their hearts. My friends, this faith, this gospel of Jesus is as freely offered to all as his demands are completely total for our lives. Jesus freely, by grace, through his death, burial, and resurrection, will give you knowledge of him, to know him on a personal level, will give you eternity with him, and it's all freely given, but it will cost you your life. It will cost you everything that you want. 
And believe me when I say that I, I know what it is to have the heart that the Jews had when they came out of Egypt, that despite what God was doing among them and in them and through them and the showing of God's glory before their face and all of the awesome things that God was doing through Moses, still in their hearts they said, we can meet in Egypt. I don't know if you've got that heart or not. I have suffered with that heart. I know what that heart is, and I hate it within myself. I truly hate it. Then when, when we, we, we've put our hands to the plow, and we've looked back like, like Lot's wife. Looking back at the world too often, trying to live out that deception we once lived in from the evil one, that God is holding something back from us, and we can't really be complete until we get it. He's not holding anything back. He's giving us himself, which is where we find true satisfaction and joy, but the human fallen mind and heart is so calloused and evil and frankly can be so stupid that it doesn't see that. I'm the chief stupid one here, in case you're wondering who that would be. I can't have that heart in me. I can't have that heart in me and be in the fields of God's harvest, and neither can you. You see, friend, our Lord Jesus really is Lord. He is really Lord of all. He is Lord of everything in our lives. He is Lord of of what we wear, Lord, of where we live. He is Lord of what we say. He is Lord of what we drive. He is Lord of who we hang out with. He is Lord of all. And he will be Lord of all to you or nothing. He's Lord of the harvest. Is there a priority in your life or mine that we are putting before him? Is it family? Is it even religious service? I tell you, one of the wildest things that happens to us, friend, is we can be plugged in right here. We can be doing our thing. We're teaching Sunday school. We're, we're uh, leading Wednesday night. We're doing all of that. We can be so very close to what Jesus is about and still not be following him. We can even elevate our ministry above him, guilty of that. I've done that. Is it your home? Massive investments in homes here. Is it work, career, retirement? Let's pray that God would cleanse and flush our hearts of all that tempts us to look back once our hands have been put to the kingdom plow. And let us do so realizing that when we prioritize him as first, as king, as Lord in our lives, that it's then we'll find secondly that he will bring the harvest. Read with me here from chapter 10 and verse 1. After this, the Lord appointed 70 others and sent them out ahead of him in pairs. That would be 35, right? Y'all about as good at math as I am. I think that's 35. 35 pairs to every town and place where he himself was about to go. God explains this here. He explains to us that these 70 were sent out to prepare the way for Christ to come. What an awesome mission they had. Charles Spurgeon says of them, what a mercy it is when the preacher knows that his master is coming after him, when he can hear the sound of his master's feet behind him, what courage it gives him. He knows that, though it is a very little thing he can do, he is the thin edge of the wedge, preparing the way for the one who can do everything. That's what we are. That's what harvesters are. That's what working in these fields is all about. We work in these fields of human souls we are planting seed we are watering seed 
gospel seed. It is God that will give the growth. It is God that will bring the harvest. It's not your job to do that, and it's not mine. Our job is to share. His job is to save. It's his harvest. Don't act like it's yours or mine. So many times we decide we won't witness because we might say something wrong, which is an amazingly great excuse. Oh, you know, I would share with that person, but what if I say something wrong? I'd just like to remind everybody they're going to hell anyway. It, it won't get any worse for them. And I believe if you're saved, you know what to say. Otherwise, you wouldn't know how to be saved. Other times, we just value and find other things more important. We don't have the time, we say. Sometimes we think we've got more opportunities ahead of us, so we don't share because we think we tell ourselves there will be another opportunity where I will share with them. You remember the day that our Lord Jesus was going through the land of Samaria, don't you? That was a big taboo thing for him to do anyway because no Jew would go through such a half-breed land as the Samaritan. They didn't want to be around them. They thought they were completely unclean. They didn't want to have anything to do with them. But Jesus said, let's go through that land. And he went through that land and he goes to the well. There's a woman there. And this woman had all kinds of issues in her life. She had been through men one after another. She had not lived a life of righteousness. She's there getting water at a time when nobody else would be there. And then Jesus comes up and he starts to talk with her. Another taboo. Jewish men don't speak to women, especially if their husbands aren't there. Turn this into evangelism. I don't know what Jesus was thinking. <laughs> so he starts to talk with her and he explains to her, I'm the living water. You drink of me, you're never going to thirst again. And she got it. She realized this was the Messiah. This was the one. And she put her faith in him and she was saved right there. And she runs back and she tells all the villagers, come meet a man who's told me everything I've ever done. Could this be the Messiah? And all starts running back. Now, in the meantime, the disciples, true Jews, they're worried about one thing. You don't know what that one thing was. Do you remember what that was? The, the master hasn't ate. The master has not been. We're going to totally overlook the fact that we're in Samaria and he's talking to a woman here. We need to make sure he's paid. So they, they ask him about eating. He tells them, listen boys, I've got food to eat that you know not of. My food is to do the will of him who sent me. My food is to do my father's will. And then Jesus says, don't you say there are still four more months, then comes the harvest? Listen to what I'm telling you. Open your eyes and look at the fields, for they are ready to harvest. That's just like us. Don't you say, ah, oh, there'll be another opportunity. Don't you say, well, we can, we, we can wait to a better time. The Jews would say, we've got four months to the harvest. We don't have to mess with this right now. We say, we've got more time. And Jesus says, open your eyes and see. There's no time to play around. It is here. It is now. Souls are going to hell. Every day around us. The Bible says the smoke of their torment rises up forever and ever. Could you imagine being held under the wrath of God for all eternity? When there was a Christian right beside you who said, I got more time. I got more time. The heart we need to have, my brothers and sisters, 
is a heart that is willing to set aside every social taboo and even the needs of our own bodies to get in the fields and work these fields of harvest. We need a heart of compassion for the lost and conviction that people are going to a Christless eternity without him. And he has saved us, friends, sinners though we were, to go and tell other sinners how they can be saved through him. And just let me put this one to you again. Because it's such an issue here where we live. Do not think for a minute that just because somebody says we go to church here, that that means they have entered the kingdom of God. And by here, I don't mean literally at First Baptist, any church. Do you believe in Jesus? Oh, well, sure. Where do you go to church? Oh, I go to the St. Sylvester. Oh, well, awesome. Okay, well, I'll just walk along and not have to inconvenience myself with sharing the true gospel with you. That person going to hell without Christ. Even though they sit under a steeple. Even though their names are on a membership roll. Don't we realize, or I pray we realize that one of Satan's greatest devices for locking men in hell is to do it through religious means. In fact, when the Antichrist comes to rule the world, yes, the chief way he will do it, he will create a religion that welcomes all men unto himself. And from that religion will be born the worship of the beast. It's all around us. It's all around us. If people cannot communicate with you that they are saved by grace through faith in Christ alone, the true gospel has not come into their hearts. Let me encourage you that I believe, I believe the Father will reward the effort of taking this gospel to the lost. Is it going to be discouraging sometimes? Oh, absolutely. Yes. You say, oh, well, thanks for the inspiration, I'm preacher. No, I'm just being honest with you. And I, I'm being honest with you because the ironic thing is, as excited as you are at the possibility of somebody being saved, that person could very well be totally unexcited at the prospect of it. Not everybody's going to share our enthusiasm for Christ or his salvation, and that can be discouraging. But as it is written, let us not lose heart in doing good. For in due time we will reap if we do not grow weary. At times will it be painful? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You might have children or other family members or close friends that are in a, that are in a state of rejecting Christ. And this is another one that I'm out of touch with. Only the fear of that happening has entered my mind. For some of you, it's become a reality. And I would think that's one of the greatest nightmares we could know. Let me encourage you. Psalm 126.5, those who sow in tears shall reap with shouts of joy. He who goes out weeping, bearing the seed of sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, bringing his sheaves with him. Don't give up. Keep getting that gospel message into that field. Let us find ourselves faithful to scatter those gospel seeds and we'll find Jesus faithful to glorify himself through the salvation of souls. This is why we must pray for God to send more workers into the harvest. It's not an option. He's not saying if you feel like it. He's saying you pray this because I'm Lord of the harvest. Pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. And my friends, we will find our true level of concern about the harvest based on our true level of prayer for it. Let me explain it like this. I am deeply concerned about my wife. That's why I pray for her every day. I am deeply concerned about my children. That's why I pray for them every day. I am deeply concerned 
about my church family. That's why I pray for you every day. Now, if I am not praying for God to send out laborers into the harvest, what does that tell me about my heart? I'm not concerned about this. If you're not praying for it, that's the problem. We don't have the concern we should have. If the harvest is a great concern of ours, we will be praying for God to send more workers into it and we'll be praying for God to save souls for himself through the gospel labor and we will be those laborers in the fields. We are on mission with God in this and here is how he likes to work. A man named Evan Roberts, big leader in the Welsh revival of years ago, he once said, but this is how it works. This, this is going to condense down a full semester of seminary class on prayer for you. You ready for this? He says, God wants a thing done, moves a believer to pray that it may be done, and then God does it in answer to that prayer. That's it. That's it. Folks, we depend upon him for everything. Therefore, we must pray. We depend on him to empower our lives and our ministry. Therefore, we must pray. We depend upon him to bring a harvest. Therefore, we must pray. We depend upon him to change lives, even ours. Therefore, we must pray. So let's do that. Father, as we come before you in Jesus' name, I pray for us each and every one today. Lord, give us a holy burden about these fields of harvest that are ripe and a holy burden about more laborers going into those fields and a holy burden, Lord, that we would be those laborers. Lord, we pray that you would change our hearts, change our outlook, to where we prioritize you above all, and that we let nothing in this world, Lord, distract us or take us away from your calling to follow you, even into these fields of harvest. And I pray now, Father, if there is one single person here today, man, woman, boy, or girl, Father, I pray, if they need your salvation, let them see Christ with open arms, crucified and risen for them. Let them see the commitment he requires from them, but let them see the life he gives and lead them now to trust in you, to put their faith in you, to confess their sins and confess their faith in you as Savior and as Lord. And Lord, move among us all to use us, to impact the darkness around us with your light and your truth. And we pray, Father, these things in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen.